Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientists monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host and moderator for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Carrie Bearden will present the Adolescent Brain and Mood Disorder Risk. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation is committed to alleviating the suffering caused by mental illness by awarding grants that will lead to advances and breakthroughs in scientific research. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $340 million and is the largest private funder of mental health research grants. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in grants to scientists who are working to find breakthroughs in disorders such as ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, OCD, PTSD, and schizophrenia. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Carrie Bearden. Dr. Bearden is a professor in the Departments of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and Psychology at the University of California in Los Angeles. She is the recipient of two foundation-funded NARSAD Young Investigator Grants in 2003 and 2005. Dr. Bearden will discuss biological and psychosocial changes that take place in adolescence and how these factors may be relevant to increased risk for mood disorder during this vulnerable period. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Bearden's presentation, which will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. Following the presentation, I will present your questions to Dr. Bearden, and we will address as many as possible in the time allotted. And now, I'm pleased to present Dr. Carrie Bearden. Carrie, the floor is yours. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. I am going to, let's see, should I, can anyone, I don't know if you can see my screen yet or. You, you need uh, to share the screen, uh, click on the pop-up. Do I click change, oh no, not change presenter. Sorry, show. Just show, show. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've been made the presenter, show my screen. Okay, and so right now, Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, hopefully everyone can see that. So thank you so much, Jeff, and uh, really thank you again for the invitation to present today. You know, I really want to mention that NARSAD, or the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, is really dear to me as um, you actually really got me started in research with the Young Investigator Award many years ago before anyone else was willing to give me any money, so I'm very grateful for that. Well, so welcome everyone and good morning or evening, depending on what time zone you're in. And, you know, webinars are, are kind of tricky for me because, um, you know, I'm literally sitting in my office talking to myself right now, so I can't, I can't see your facial expressions, I can't tell if, I'm, you know, what I'm saying is making sense or resonating with you, so I'm really going to try to leave some time for questions at the end and, and discussion, so, um, you know, please feel free to email your questions to Jeff. Okay, so very quickly, I have no disclosures, uh, simple. So let me give you just an outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. So uh, first of all, I'll be uh, giving a brief overview of uh, these ideas about brain plasticity and vulnerability in adolescence and uh, how we think that might relate to increased vulnerability to developing mood disorders during this time period then how those, uh, those uh, brain changes may relate to sleep and circadian changes in adolescence. And then uh, in the last segment of the talk, I'm going to talk about um, some work that we've been doing in Latin America, looking at families that, have, uh, that are severely uh, affected with bipolar disorder. And a pilot study that we're starting, uh, we're just actually getting started with looking at adolescents um, who are at a, a familial high risk for uh, bipolar disorder. So the teenage brain, and this is just a, a picture that I really love, um, the teenage brain is something we're really just beginning to appreciate 
this degree of extensive remodeling and rewiring of the brain that goes on during adolescence. And, and we've known for many years about this incredibly plastic period of brain development that uh, in early childhood for things like language learning and cognitive development. And in recent years, there's been a huge upsurge of interest in what goes on in the brain during adolescence. And it's become increasingly clear there is um, incredible structural reorganization of the brain that goes on during this period that's really analogous to this developmental window of increased plasticity that's seen in infancy. Now, what are some of these structural changes? Well, we view adolescence as a time of both incredible potential as well as significant vulnerability. So there are changes in uh, the gray matter of the brain. These are the neurons or brain cells. And, uh, and the, the synaptic connections between brain cells are overproduced early in development, and there's a process called synaptic pruning, where these exuberant connections are actually pruned back uh, during adolescence. And, and there's also changes in the white matter of the brain, and these are uh, these uh, uh, myelinated fiber tracts that form connections in, uh, between different brain regions. So we can really think about these as is essentially like the internet of the brain. And so during adolescence, your brain is becoming much more efficient. There are processes of, of typical development where, uh, for example, the hippocampus, which is involved in memory, and the frontal lobes involved in higher order cognition undergo the majority of, of myelination during this adolescent period. And this continues into adulthood. And so these uh, concomitant changes that are occurring we think um, are likely relevant uh, to, uh, to increased risk for psychopathology during this time period because of the significant structural reorganization that's occurring. So the first areas to mature in early childhood are those with the most basic functions, such as uh, uh, brain areas that are involved in uh, sensory processing and movement. Then uh, during uh, early childhood and going into puberty, there's a growth spurt in temporal regions involved in language, also parietal lobes, um, important for visual spatial functions and mathematics. And what's really interesting is that uh, these uh, higher order brain regions, pre the prefrontal cortex in particular, is matures later, so um, during this adolescent period. And uh, this is, we think, uh, related to the development of, of processes like self-control, planning, and the regulation of behavior. And so the adolescent age period is often characterized as a health paradox because it is this time of you have really have these extensive increases in physical and mental capabilities. And yet at the same time, the overall mortality and morbidity rates increase significantly to, from childhood to adolescence. And this is often due to preventable causes. Uh, uh, such as, as risk-taking behavior. And so we think that this asynchrony in developmental time courses between uh, effective or approach behaviors and cognitive control brain systems may lead to this increased vulnerability for risk-taking risk during this adolescent period. And uh, the, the fact that the prefrontal cortical maturation, so both the dorsolateral and orbital frontal regions of the, the prefrontal cortex, is assumed to correspond to the development of, of these higher level cognitive processes. Now at the same time, maturing subcortical systems, regions of the brain involved in things like reward processing, like the nucleus accumbens, are disproportionately activated relative to these top-down control systems in adolescence. And just to show you a little bit more of, of some evidence for this, uh, this is a functional neuroimaging study from my colleague at UCLA, Adriana Galvan, uh, using a task-based functional neuroimaging and so in task-based fMRI, we can look at regions of the brain that show increased neural activity when someone's performing a particular cognitive task. And so this is a paradigm uh, which parametrically manipulates reward values. And so um, essentially, uh, and this task was given to child, adult, uh, child, adolescent, and adult participants. And what participants didn't realize is that there were different cues that corresponded to a different uh, amount of, of monetary reward that they saw. So the pirate's doing this, then you get one coin, and the pirate's doing something else, and you get a you know, medium amount of coins, and the pirate's looking through the telescope, and you get a lot. So um, the subject sees the cue, then there's a delay, and then you choose, you know, do you think the treasure's in the left or the right box, and then you get your reward. And so what Adriana found in this study is that there were actually, uh, well, across subjects, across all age groups, there was increased activity in the nucleus accumbens, this region is involved in reward processing in the brain with larger rewards, and that's what you would expect. And also, you see increased activity in a brain region, uh, the lateral orbit or frontal cortex, 
which is involved in reward valuation and reward-related decision-making with the greater value of the reward. But what was uh, the other interesting thing was that adolescence, shown here, showed an increase, so basically an exaggerated change in neural activity to the large reward relative to what was seen in both children and adults um, in the nucleus accumbens. But they actually showed a significantly less activity in this frontal brain region, the orbitofrontal cortex. And so these findings really suggest that maturing subcortical systems become disproportionately activated relative to later maturing uh, top-down control systems which may bias an adolescent's action toward immediate over long-term gains. And the other interesting thing was there was a positive association between a nucleus accumbens activity and the likelihood of engaging in risky behavior across development. Now, how does this relate to uh, mood disorders? Well, do we, we think that perhaps this frontal subcortical imbalance may be also related to increased mood lability. Now, when we look at mood disorder prevalence in kids um, 8 to 15 years old, the first thing that you notice here is that there's a big sex difference. So uh, girls have about twice the rate of mood disorders um, as do boys. But secondly, uh, this prevalence about doubles around the time of puberty. And when we look uh, across the age range, um, you know, you can see that something is really happening during this adolescent period. And so this shift um, occurs um, between the ages of 13 and 18, where overall we start out with a prevalence of about 9% of mood disorders, which goes up to almost 20% um, in, in 17 to 18 year olds. So this is a really significant change. Now, going back to the potential relevance of reward processing uh, in relation to risk for mood disorders, um, these are some very nice data from Manfred Singh, um, looking at neural activation associated with response to wins and losses. In uh, these are from uh, children born to parents with bipolar disorder, uh, so those are who are genetic high risk for a mood disorder, uh, compared to children of parents who did not have bipolar disorder. And so um, what Manfred found is that there's a difference in how the high-risk group process rewards um, compared to losses. And this is during an fMRI task of a monetary incentive delay where people are either winning or losing money. And uh, so in particular, the high-risk group showed differences within this pregenual cingulate region, uh, which is a brain region that's uh, really implicated in motivation and emotion. And so neural activity within this pregenual cingulate cluster um, which is shown here, you can see that during the anticipation of losses, the low-risk group had a significantly higher um, pregenual cingulate activation um, compared to uh, the high-risk group, so those at high risk for bipolar disorder. And this pattern is essentially switched in the high-risk group, where uh, they have significantly higher um, pregenual cingulate activation during anticipation of rewards compared to anticipation of losses. And so essentially, this aberrant prefrontal activation and connectivity during reward processing uh, appears uh, may be related to early vulnerability for a dysfunctional regulation of emotion and goal pursuit in children who are at high risk uh, for mania. The other thing uh, that uh, Manpreet found was that novelty seeking and impulsivity, self-reported uh, impulsivity, were associated with increased striatal and amygdala activation. Now, other key changes that occur during adolescence. Sleep is a really big uh, thing that changes during this period. So newborn babies sleep about 16 to 18 hours, um, of course, in three to four hour chunks. Um, around age five, uh, children tend to sleep about 11 hours a night. And in adolescence, this really changes. So our nighttime sleep reduces from about nine hours at age 13 to eight hours uh, or less than eight hours at age 16. There are circadian changes in adolescence where there's a delay in circadian phase and sleep onset. These relate to hormonal changes also that occur during this time period. And so this um, so sleep onset often shifts past midnight in adolescence. At the same time, there's an increased biological need for sleep that's associated with pubertal development. So um, most adolescents really don't get enough sleep. And uh, this is you know, uh, sometimes referred to as an inadequate sleep epidemic in adolescence. And so um, these are, are data from the World Health Organization here. So uh, almost 70% of adolescents get uh, what's considered insufficient sleep, less than seven hours a night. And uh, only uh, about 7.6% are getting what's considered optimal sleep. So nationwide, almost 70% of students report insufficient sleep on an average school night. 
Now we know that this poor sleep has functional consequences. Poor sleep is associated with poor academic performance for adolescents from middle school through college. Insufficient sleep is also associated with higher odds of, of things like substance abuse, risky behavior, sadness, as well as suicidal ideation. Now, I, I guess we all have days when we feel like grumpy cat. Um, you know, this, this really, this might have been me this morning, the worst thing after waking up, everything until I go to bed again. So I know we all have days like this sometimes, but it turns out that there are a couple of factors that really tend to be related to sleep that really are risk factors for mood dysregulation. And one of them is uh, eveningness, that is being a night owl. So something about this chronotype, um, well, there's a question, actually, um, whether something about this chronotype is inherent related to increased mood dysregulation, or is it just because being a night owl is sort of a bad fit with school schedules, and these ch children are, are really inherent, um, you know, sort of chronically sleep deprived. But so this has been studied on a pretty large scale. So in a survey of um, over 6,000 adolescents, um, eveningness, that is uh, being a night owl, was associated with more daytime sleepiness more attention problems, um, poor school achievement, more injuries, um, more emotional upset, and, and more sleep disturbance overall. And uh, this, uh, there was also a sleep habits survey administered to 3,000 high school students, uh, which uh, found that students who slept less than six hours and 45 minutes on school nights or had a greater than two hour weekend bedtime delay reported increased daytime sleepiness, depressive mood, and sleep-wake behavior problems. So it's both being a night owl and also increased sleep variability or, or lack of a regular sleep schedule that may be risk factors for mood dysregulation. And um, just to show you some additional data on this, this was uh, work from my colleague Andrew Fellini using a daily diary uh, sort of paradigm uh, across um, several months in adolescence. And one of the, the really interesting things here is that, uh, first of all, a, amount of, of daily sleep that adolescents are getting is uh, related to, so less daily sleep is related to increased anxiety, depression, and fatigue, and lower ratings of happiness, and these are all self-report ratings. The other important thing to notice here is that it's not just the overall amount of sleep you're getting, but also sleep de deviation, so how variable is your sleep? And so people with, so adolescents with more uh, sleep variability had higher anxiety, dep depression, and fatigue, as well as uh, somewhat lower ratings of happiness. Um, so, it, so really, um, I want to emphasize this point that sleep variability appears to be just as important for average daily levels of psychological well-being as well as the average amount of time actually spent asleep. So what controls the sleep-wake cycle in humans? Uh, well, there is a lot of evidence that the sleep-wake cycle is regulated by an interaction uh, between circadian rhythm, which is driven by a structure called the suprachiasmatic nucleus and the hypothalamus, as well as uh, uh, this homeostatic process, which is determined by essentially a balance between prior uh, sleep and wakefulness. And so this homeostat is what allows us to maintain wakefulness during the day and also to promote sleep at night. Now, of course, moving into clinically significant sleep disturbance, uh, this is a German psychiatrist, Emil Kreiflin, who was really one of the first to make the observation of this profound sleep disturbance that occurs in patients with bipolar disorder. And so um, in his book, which is based on observing uh, uh, inpatients with bipolar disorder, uh, Neil Kreiflin notes, the attacks of manic depressive insanity are invariably accompanied by all kinds of bodily changes, by far the most striking are disorders of sleep and general nourishment. In mania, sometimes there's even almost complete sleeplessness, and most interrupted for a few hours, which may last for weeks, even months. In the states of depression, in spite of great need for sleep, the patients lie for hours sleepless in bed, although even in bed they find no refreshment. And so I think this is a really important early observation. Now, sleep is something that we may take for granted. Um, I mean, I think that that's not true of people who have sleep disturbance or insomnia, but uh, it turns out that, that sleep actually serves an incredibly important biological function and um, may be necessary for effective thermoregulation. So um, in the 1850s, um, another psychiatrist documented several cases of florid mania characterized by almost no sleep that typically actually ended fatally. And also in animal models of sleep deprivation, uh, the, pro the outcome of prolonged sleep de deprivation is actually death um, despite increased food intake. And, uh, and so sleep deprivation was observed to produce a reliable syndrome involving a debilitated appearance uh, skin lesions, weight loss, increased energy expenditure, and uh, body temperature. 
and, and, and ultimately death. So sleep is important. Um, and some of the lines of evidence for a central role of uh, sleep disturbance in, and, and, and as well as circadian disturbance in bipolar disorder, um, we know that sleep disturbances are among the most prominent correlates of, of both mood episodes as well as inadequate recovery in individuals with bipolar disorder. Um, another important observation is that impaired sleep can both induce and predict manic episodes. Now we know that, um, uh, of course, that manic and depressed states have a cyclic nature and uh, that diurnal mood variation is also um, an important part of, of uh, mood disorder. There's also evidence for uh, circadian genes um, that may be involved. So uh, the clock, uh, there's a, a knockout mouse model of mania. Um, this is a, a clock knockout mouse and clock is a circadian protein which has been shown to exhibit um, manic-like behaviors, which actually were reversed with lithium treatment, which is, of course, the first-line treatment for bipolar disorder. And we know that um, clock is actually involved in regulation of dopaminergic activity. Now, so this is a model hypothesized by uh, Ware and colleagues that sleep deprivation is essentially a fundamental proximal cause or a final common pathway of mania. And so the idea here is that regardless of the cause of your sleep disturbance, it might be due to um, an illness, it might be due to, you know, let's say, uh, an infant um, or emotional excitation, uh, things like uh, disrupted sleep schedule, essentially anything that results in this final common pathway of sleep reduction uh, contributes to uh, uh, an onset of mania. And so there's this bidirectional relationship between daytime affect regulation and nighttime sleep. So you get the, this escalating sort of vicious circle of disturbance um, during the day, which then interferes with nighttime sleep and circadian functioning. And the effects of sleep deprivation contribute to difficulty in affect regulation the following day. Okay. So I'm going to transition now to telling you a little bit um, about a project that we've been conducting over the past several years in, in large families with multiple affected members with severe bipolar disorder in, in Latin America. And this is work that I've been conducting with my colleague Nelson Freimer at UCLA. Um, so the history of this region uh, in Latin America is actually really interesting. Um, this is a, they're a genetically isolated population. Um, established in the 16th and 17th centuries. And uh, the, the two regions that I'm going to be speaking about are this um, region in the Central Valley of Costa Rica and uh, also this area uh, surrounding Medellin, uh, Colombia, called Antioquia. And uh, these populations involve an admixture of uh, very genetically similar founder populations of Amerindian um, uh, native uh, uh, population and uh, immigrants from uh, southern Spain. And so there's essentially exponential growth of, uh, from a small number of founders. So there were founders that came to the, the, uh, the, the region in the 16th century and essentially no new immigration to the region for several hundred years, um, forming this, this bottleneck. And so um, the population that we've been studying, um, these are 26 families that are heavily loaded for severe bipolar disorder. And so they tend to have a very uh, severe and psychotic form of bipolar illness. And so to date, we've studied about 750 individuals in these families. Um, 530 of them uh, have gotten uh, MRI scans. And so when we started the project, there was only one uh, MRI scanner in the whole country of Costa Rica. And so we were really concerned that that scanner was going to break down before we were able to finish the study. But fortunately, it didn't, and we were able to finish uh, collecting the data. But um, as I, I mentioned, um, the foundation of both of these populations um, involved this rapid admixture between a few European settlers and this small indigenous population. And so we, uh, genetic studies have shown that these populations are really remarkably genetically similar with the male and ancestry deriving mainly from Spain and female ancestry from a single Amerindian group. And so uh, this is a 17th century painting that really uh, depicts this, this kind of admixture that I'm talking about. And so uh, this work really takes us to some um, very beautiful and exotic locations. Uh, one of the advantages of, of doing this work, and um, this is the village of Acosta uh, in Costa Rica, where many of the families live. And this is uh, the view from the airport coming into Medellin, Colombia. And so the, the really great thing about working with these, um, these families is that this is, you know, we can think of this as a genetically enriched population, which really allows a unique opportunity to investigate gene-environment interactions um, that may be relevant to the development of, of mood disorder. 
And so the strategy um, that we've been using here uh, is to prioritize the most informative um, pedigree branches. And this is just um, an example of, and this is one family, one large family from Costa Rica. And so you can see that these families really provide a lot of information for genetic mapping studies. Um, thanks to church records, we also have a lot of information going back several generations. And so uh, what we did essentially was prioritize the most informative branches, that is um, taking nuclear families that had at least one uh, individual with bipolar 1 disorder and at least two unaffected siblings in the family. And then uh, we would also study their uh, uh, children as well as their parents if they were available. And just, just to tell you a little bit more about the population, um, we studied about 750 individuals from these, of these large pedigrees, um, of whom 181 of them were affected with bipolar 1 disorder. And uh, you can see that the mean age here um, was about 48 in both countries, uh, but the age range um, was 18 to 87 because um, these spanned three generations. And also um, the mean education um, was pretty low, about an eighth grade uh, education on average, although there, there was some variability, but this is a pretty rural population. And so one of the key questions we had was, you know, can we advance our understanding of disease states by elucidating the biology beneath the syndrome? And so, you know, at this higher level here, we have a, you know, DSM diagnosis. And so by looking at uh, things like underlying symptoms, quantitative behavioral traits, neural circuitry, um, and then at the, the level of signaling pathways, we were particularly interested in circadian biology, given uh, its, its potential role in the pathophysiology of, of bipolar illness, and then, of course, uh, the genetic level. So uh, we have been, um, you know, it's taken us quite a while to collect all these data um, across multiple levels of analysis. So um, we did clinical interviews, and when I say we, I really mean our um, research team and collaborators um, in Costa Rica and Colombia. So we really developed um, an amazing partnership um, with the, uh, the group there. So uh, we studied um, measures like self-report, temperament, delusion proneness, um, creativity, impulsivity, uh, structural neuroanatomy, cognition, and um, I'll get to the sleep and circadian rhythms is um, one of the, the uh, phenotypes I'm going to focus on here. Um, and then we also have been looking at uh, gene expression obtained from both blood as well as uh, fibroblasts or skin cells. So um, I'm going to talk first about some of the findings um, in our adult sample that are motivating the study we're starting now in adolescents. And so uh, what you're looking at here is um, brain regions that are found to be both significantly heritable, that is, they uh, uh, have a genetic component, um, and also uh, significantly associated with bipolar disorder within these families. And so some of the, the brain regions I'm going to highlight, um, we found that the inferior frontal gyrus was uh, significantly thinner in um, the bipolar probands compared to their non-bipolar relatives. And this is a brain region that's involved in response inhibition. So tasks involving inhibition of a prepotent response. And, and so we were excited to find this as it really maps very well to some of key, you know, some of the key aspects of bipolar pathophysiology. Also the lateral orbital frontal cortex, which I think I mentioned previously, a brain region that's really important for things like reward and decision making. And then um, it, down here in the ventral surface, in addition to frontal regions, um, we also saw cortical thinning in the bipolar proband in uh, temporal regions as well as uh, of the fusiform gyrus, which is particularly interesting given that this is a brain region um, known to be involved in facial emotion identification and face processing, which are uh, cognitive functions that are known to be impaired in behavioral studies in both adults um, with bipolar disorder as well as at-risk uh, adolescents. So the other trait that we measured that I'm going to tell you a little bit more about today um, from the domain of activity and circadian rhythms, and so we measured this um, using this little uh, device called an ActiWatch that looks exactly like a you know digital wristwatch, uh, but actually um, is both very expensive and, and gives you gives you a lot of other information as well. And so uh, these are data gathered from a single uh, individual over about 10 days, and so. Uh, the black here is showing these uh, little blips are uh, basically data collected in one minute epochs of um, activity levels. The yellow here is ambient light. And uh, this blue is where um, we've set what the rest period for this individual was. And so you can see that we can gather a lot of information in terms of um, sleep duration as well as um, things like sleep and activity 
variability and so forth. So what are we finding? Um, well, on average, bipolar 1, uh, and these are again adults, um, bipolar 1 participants um, tended toward a later timing for both their peak activity, um, which is called the acrophase, as well as um, mid-sleep behavior. So um, the other point that I want to make here is that both of these traits, although they were um, different in the bipolar patients compared to their relatives, they're also highly heritable, so there does appear to be a genetic component. Now, I apologize, this figure is, um, I'm sorry, it's going to be really hard to, to read, but don't worry, I'm going to summarize it. Um, so it turns out there's a lot of information um, we can get from an actigraph. And so um, we've reduced this down to just, just 73 um, sleep and activity phenotypes from our raw activity data. And so um, essentially what we did here was to estimate the familial aggregation of these 73 phenotypes. Um, an indicator which is an indicator of heritability and the relationship to bipolar 1. And so that really allows us to determine which of these phenotypes have a significant genetic component in order to proceed with analyses to actually identify genes um, that may be contributing to the phenotypes that we think are, uh, you know, are really important to the etiology of, of bipolar disorder. Now, of these uh, 73 phenotypes we studied, so this inner uh, circle here is showing you the heritability estimate. And so we found that 67% uh, of these uh, traits demonstrated significant heritability, indicating you know, a potential genetic component um, in these pedigrees. And so um, just to summarize here, since I know those uh, data were pretty hard to read, um, in terms of heritable traits, we found that both sleep and activity duration, as well as um, things like the timing and fragmentation and consolidation of sleep, as well as activity level and variability, and the timing and periodicity of mean daily activity, all these were significantly heritable. And as I mentioned, um, in uh, bipolar 1 disorder, in the, the probands of bipolar 1 disorder, they showed a later sleep offset and a longer sleep duration, as well as greater variability um, in uh, sleep and, uh, and activity levels, um, which, you know, is, is not particularly surprising given the, the you know, bipolar phenotype. So the next thing we did was to take the traits that we found a, um, uh, were significantly heritable, and we looked for genetic loci with the largest impact on sleep and activity phenotypes um, in these pedigrees. So this was a genome-wide linkage analysis, um, and we used a dense set of SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms for 13 of our most highly heritable phenotypes. And so this was a multi-point linkage analysis on these 13 phenotypes. And essentially, what we find here is we had a, the, our highest, uh, our most significant hit was for a region on chromosome 12P. And this was, in fact, a hit for um, a measure of interdaily stability, which can be considered an indirect marker of entrainment. And this is pretty interesting, I think, in the context of the bipolar phenotype involving essentially episodic variation in sleep and activity levels. And uh, this was actually a, a pleiotropic, uh, this is a region of pleiotropic linkage. And so in other words, it was also, it was associated with multiple traits. Um, so both as well as, so in addition to uh, intradaily stability, also um, things like the mean number of sleep bouts. So there are a lot of sleep traits that were actually associated um, with this region. And now with uh, linkage studies, you know, we're looking at essentially a, a region of the genome that includes several genes. but some of the genes that are within this linkage peak that I want to highlight, uh, there are in fact several genes here that could plausibly influence activity-related behaviors. So uh, one of them is the JARAD1 gene, which actually forms a complex of uh, core clock proteins, uh, clock and BMAL1, and in fact recruits them to the PER2 promoter and enhances uh, PER2 prescription, and this is also a circadian uh, protein. And depletion of this protein in mammalian cells has been shown to shorten the circadian period. The other uh, really interesting gene that is within this region is a calcium channel gene, um, the CACNAC1-1C uh, 1, 1 gene. And uh, this uh, gene has a circadian expression pattern. Loss of this gene has been shown to affect uh, phase advance of wheel running behavior in mice and, um, and also to um, impair um, expression of these other circadian proteins. Now, the reason this, this gene is also is particularly exciting to us is that um, multiple psychiatric genome-wide association studies have identified significant um, associations uh, with bipolar disorder um, of this um, calcium channel gene. So we think this is really important and something that's going to be interesting to follow up on. 
So of course the next question um, that I'm particularly interested in, you know, can we investigate these genetically mediated phenotypes earlier in development? And so as I mentioned, and just to briefly summarize here, we think that this asynchrony and developmental time course is between effective approach and, and cognitive control brain systems may lead to increased vulnerability for risk taking in this adolescent period. These um, dynamic changes in subcortical uh, systems that uh, appear disproportionately activated relative to top-down control uh, at corresponding to these major shifts in sleep and circadian rhythms that occur during adolescence. So basically all of these changes are occurring simultaneously. And so um, our, our basically now that we've established uh, all of this information and the parents of these um, children in these families are going to be an incredibly informative population to study longitudinally. And so that's really what we're interested in doing next. Now, when we look at, um, you know, and thinking about what may be a biomarker that might predict an initial onset of a manic episode, sleep disturbance is actually a really good bet. Um, in fact, sleep disturbance represents the most common prodrome of mania, and it is also among the most common prodromes of depression. This has been found across a number of studies. Um, so looking at the phenomenology of our initial mania prodrome, we really see that um, sleep dis uh, disruption or decreased need for sleep is one of the most prominent features. And so um, we've just started looking at adolescents um, in these large pedigrees in Latin America. And uh, so I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of some of the things we're finding. And again, um, we're just getting started, but I, I think it's really interesting. So in 17 um, offspring of, of these uh, bipolar parents, we found a really high rate of uh, psychopathology, so both anxiety and mood disorder. 66% um, of these adolescents uh, met criteria for an anxiety disorder. And uh, this was really interesting to us, particularly given that despite the fact that this is a really uh, unique population in many ways, um, we find this is very, very similar to what's been found in um, other high-risk populations in Western countries, um, either in the U.S. or Europe, um, indicating you know, particularly high rates of anxiety as well as uh, in attentional disorders. And so uh, just to briefly uh, show you some of our preliminary data that we found, um, we see that using a measure of the daily stress inventory, we see that greater stability of daily rhythms as measured with the uh, ActiWatch is associated with lower self-reported stress um, in adolescents. The other uh, finding looking at environmental factors, we found that greater family conflict is associated with um, higher uh, self-reported mood and anxiety in high-risk adolescents. Again, that's not particularly surprising, but I think it's important that we're seeing these patterns, um, you know, in a, a very uh, genetically different population. Um, we also see that greater family conflict was associated with uh, cognitive uh, differences, so greater family conflict associated with poorer memory um, within these high-risk adolescents. Now, of course, these are all uh, cross-sectional data. So I think one of the really important questions that I'm sure you're wondering about is, you know, what is the direction of causality here? So, does disrupted or unstable sleep schedule cause you to have more self-reported daily stress, or are you not sleeping well because you're stressed out? Um, and of course, the same questions really arise regarding the associations and we're finding between family conflict and clinical and, and cognitive symptoms. And so the next thing that we really, of course, need to do is a prospective longitudinal study um, of these adolescent uh, offspring of bipolar parents. And, and you know, we think this really provides an unprecedented opportunity for connecting risk genes to brain development and to uh, emergent psychopathology. And so just taking one possible example of how something like this might work, um, for example, given the likely involvement of circadian disruption in the pathophysiology of bipolar illness, mutations in clock genes. Um, now, we know that there's not one gene that causes bipolar disorder, but just as an example, Mutations in clock genes may disrupt sleep and they have a, may, may have a cascading effect on environmental factors, resulting in increased irritability, um, perhaps more uh, hostile family interactions, and then leading to um, perhaps increased disruption of frontal limbic circuitry and then creating uh, essentially a, a vicious cycle here. And uh, so this is, is um, just one example of the kinds of gene and our environment interactions that may be at play, which um, again, you know, we're, we're hoping to uh, investigate in a prospective longitudinal study. So just to bring this full circle um, back to some of the functional imaging data that I spoke about at the beginning of this talk, um, this was uh, another study using a reward paradigm 
as well as an attentional task involving top-down cognitive control. And this was actually a study done um, not in Latin America, but these are healthy individuals conducted at UCLA by Telzer and colleagues, um, looking at neural activity and performance on these two tasks, and then correlated um, this uh, task performance with sleep quality in adolescents. So what you're seeing here is neural activity in the insula, which is the brain region associated with emotional response um, in response to getting a monetary reward. And essentially, um, what they found is that behaviorally, adolescents who reported poor sleep also exhibited more risky decision making on this task. And this was um, actually paralleled by um, less recruitment of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex um, during our cognitive control task or during the cognitive control task. So essentially, greater activation of the insula during reward processing, reduced functional coupling between the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex um, and, and effective regions um, during reward processing. So essentially, the idea here is that poor sleep may exaggerate this uh, normative imbalance between effective and cognitive control systems, which may be related to increased risk-taking behavior, or possibly increased mood dysregulation um, in adolescents. Now, just to summarize, um, I think I've, I've uh, already hopefully convinced you that uh, adolescence is a period of um, you know, really incredible brain plasticity and structural reorganization. This asynchrony in developmental time courses between frontal and subcortical structures and individual differences in this asynchrony may be related to uh, increased mood dysregulation during this time period. Sleep disruption um, is a major risk factor for the development of mood disorders, um, which may in fact exaggerate this normative imbalance. And um, in our Latin American uh, pedigrees, our findings in adult pedigree members really implicate um, brain abnormalities in regions involved in inhibitory control and emotion regulation, as well as circadian rhythm disruption. And so these appear to be key heritable endophenotypes that may index disease risk and, and what um, traits that we're aiming to prospectively follow in adolescents. Our initial data in our high-risk adolescent um, sample does suggest that there are robust links between things like daily rhythm stability and stress, and uh, between a family conflict and mood and cognition. So some of the, the real clear clinical implications for some of these findings, um, we know already um, there's empirical data um, indicating that for older adults with a major depression, um, in, there's increasing evidence for the effectiveness of complementary or alternative therapies. So things that really improve sleep and daily rhythm, so yoga, tai chi, and exercise. Um, there's um, an empirically validated treatment for bipolar disorder um, developed by uh, Ellen Frank and, and colleagues at Pittsburgh on the social rhythm therapy, which essentially um, involves structuring daily activities and um, daily social contacts so that um, basically increasing regulation of these activities, regularizing daily routines, um, and also diminishing interpersonal problems. So um, this is, you know, I think a really, uh, you know, hypothesis-driven, uh, empirically designed treatment um, that's been shown to be effective. And, you know, for adolescents who don't have a mood disorder, a regular sleep schedule um, is really critical. Um, so keeping that fairly regular, avoiding overscheduling and overcommitments, I know this is a really challenging thing for adolescents who have so many different activities. but. Um, these, these data really suggest that uh, decreased sleep can really be a risk factor for um, increasing uh, mood dysregulation. So another important aspect of that is just um, limiting things like caffeine intake and screen time for adolescents at night. Um, and uh, finally, I just want to acknowledge all of our collaborators who really made this work possible. Um, particularly um, my colleague Nelson Freimer and then uh, Lucia Pagani and Joe Takahashi who were, um, uh, took the lead on the um, activity uh, data analysis. And then I want to thank our funding sources, um, particularly the uh, NIMH. And I'm going to stop there for questions. Great. Um, thank you very much, Carrie. Uh, you really presented a lot of information that shows really your work and others um, from a few different directions leading to um, what I think will help us uh, really have uh, advances in our understanding and, and treatment of these conditions. The, you spoke about some of the clinical 
uh, implications in terms of interventions. Um, the, uh, I guess a question a few people have asked relates to this and how, how do parents get their kids to have better sleep ha habits um, and better daily routines? What, what can parents do um, to help their kids with this? Yeah, I think it's a really, really important question, and you know, it's one I, <laughs> that I struggle with myself with my own kids. So, setting a regular bedtime, I think, is is really critical. And you know, for particularly for adolescents, it takes a little while to wind down um, in the evening. And so, really, and there's actually some evidence that just the you know the ambient, the light from screens, you know, from iPads or computers is um, you know somewhat disruptive to kind of settling down to to fall asleep. And so, um, you know, not having TVs, iPads, phones uh, in their room at bedtime. So really limiting access to devices, you know, probably for an hour before bed. I mean, this is something that we try to do at home. I know it's a challenge, but um, just to, to really help regulate that sleep schedule and, and, and get, you know, Sort of, I think the other important thing is that a lot of times adolescents will have a very different sleep schedule on weekends and weekdays, and so really trying to minimize that as much as possible. Um, you know, having a bedtime could be a little later on weekends, but not dramatically different because that variability makes it really hard. You, you basically develop a sleep debt, and it makes it really hard to get caught up and get back into a regular schedule. How, how does you, you in the presentation spoke about the issue of caffeine? Um, how about the issue of substance use, whether it be yes. alcohol or other substances? Um, how does that play a role in this? It, it, it absolutely plays a role. And, you know, I, I didn't specifically get into that because there's obviously a whole other area. But, but a substance use of any kind is going to, you know, really increase the – and and these things go together. So, you know, is – Increase, you know, substance abuse in adolescents. Is it a matter of, you know, self-medication versus? I mean, I think that, you know, this issue of what comes first is really hard to tease apart. But for the most part, I think that as a parent, knowing what your child is up to, knowing what they're doing after school, knowing who they're spending their time with, is is really really important. And um, you know, um, to the extent that you can keep them away from substances or that or that you know that they can make their own decisions of course um, and they're going to do that but really you know kind of helping them providing them with the tools to make smart decisions about substance use and you know I think it's I think it's it gets really complicated but you know for some adolescents that we work with they've actually come to the realization you know smoking pot actually makes me, you know, it, it makes me not sleep well. And so, I mean, that's sort of the best is when they can have their own insights into it. But sometimes, you know, adolescents really need some help getting there. And so keeping a, a, a sleep and mood diary is something that we recommend often for adolescents so that they can keep track of their own sleep and mood and really see those patterns themselves. Like, oh, yeah, you know, when I don't sleep well, it really messes me up. And so I think that even they can start to develop their own insights into it, it helps them kind of regulate their own behavior a little bit better. Right, so that if, for instance, the adolescent themselves realize they may be feeling anxious or depressed, helping them see the role that substance misuse can have in that could Absolutely. be an opportunity to control that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so keeping a diary, I think, is really helpful. Um, so it happens to be something that's easier for girl. girls tend to, you know, take to that more than boys. Um, but, you know, I think just just doing that. And then there's also there's also phone apps now that, you know, once you kind of get going with them that can are really helpful in doing things like tracking mood. Um, there's a program actually developed by Ellen Frank called Mood Rhythms. Um, that, uh, you know, where people, you can essentially plug in, you know, what time you went to bed, what time you woke up, when was your first social contact, things like that. And, and you, you know, it's a nice way of kind of seeing it laid out um, in terms of your behavioral patterns. And, okay, wow, when I, um, you know, went to this party and stayed out really late, it really messed me up the next day. And I think those are the kinds of things that, you know, having some, yeah, insight into your own patterns and what, what's helpful for you and what's not, I think, uh, is, is probably the best step, you know, and for adolescents, 
For adolescents, it's tricky um, because there are so many factors that are going to impinge on, you know, getting regular sleep. But again, I think that the more that they sort of recognize those patterns in themselves, the better it is. Right, right. Give, give, give them the ability to realize the changes that would be helpful to them. Yeah. The, I want to ask you about the, the issue of the um, asynchronous changes and that the, the vulnerability to risk taking. Um, the, the, these changes occur in the course of normal adolescence and perhaps may be a, a, a risk for um, illness. How do, how, where's the difference between the sort of typical usual changes and the changes that might be more associated with with illness. Yeah, no, I think I think it's a good question because there's essentially there are these typical developmental processes that occur during adolescence, uh, you know, involving this shift in circadian timing, and you know, and then the, and then there's increased you know reward sensitivity and increased peer influence and. And so all of these things are happening at once. And you know, the other thing is that there is individual variability, though, in how sensitive one is to rewards, and uh, you know, how exciting is this risk taking. And so I think that you know, when, when there's this confluence of factors, then some individuals are going to be more sensitive, um, you know, than others. And so there's. You know, there, there's both a genetic vulnerability as well as a, you know, and there's a lot of environmental contingencies, obviously. And so, for those who who tend to have that vulnerability, and whether it's you know tend to ha tend towards sleep disturbance, being a night owl, um, you know, having a lot of mood dysregulation. So, for people who have those vulnerability factors, um, it's probably particularly critical. Um, that some of these, you know, kind of additional structural supports are in place to keep them on a regular schedule. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. I mean, I think there's always this this issue of of it is a continuum, and when does your, you know, if you're if you are a parent and you're sort of looking at your adolescent's behavior, you know, and when when does it become worrisome? And you know, I think that I think that anytime you see a change. Um, in behavior, then that's something to worry about. Um, if you have a, a teenager who you're increasingly worried about their, um, you know, either social withdrawal, so things like withdrawing from friends and family, or, um, you know, seeming particularly moody or depressed, I mean, that's when you probably do want to intervene. As, as a parent, if you are concerned, there's a reason to be concerned, and it's worth um, getting an evaluation. And certainly if there's a change in functioning where the person might have been at one level in schoolwork and then doesn't do as well, that would be another reason, as well as socialization, et cetera. Yes, um, yes, exactly. And sometimes sometimes it is hard to know. Um, you know, I mean, I think that teenagers do have increased irritability and moodiness, and some of that is maybe typical, but I think where you really start to see it impacting their functioning or you know, where they really seem to be not enjoying themselves or, and, and sometimes they are still doing well in school but are just incredibly anxious. And so all of these things are, you know, incredibly treatable, um, but really, you know, it would be good to get that evaluated. Yeah. It's better to intervene early. Right. Better to, to be proactive in that. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, a number of people are asking about um, the issue of sleep and what steps can be taken to improve the adolescent sleep um, in addition to the, the types of steps that you said, regular bedtime and avoiding the, the light of computers and, and cell phones. Um, are there other things? There's been a lot uh, of work, a lot written about uh, cognitive behavioral techniques to improve yeah. insomnia. Is, is that something that you can you would recommend um, when there's issues with sleep? 
Yeah, there's so there's there's an online program, um, which I, and I I haven't done it myself, so my colleague has said it's helpful. It's called Sleepio, and uh, it is one of these cognitive behavioral interventions um, for 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 insomnia or sleep disturbance for a variety of reasons. Um, and there are you know I mean other things that have been shown uh, to help with sleep, not necessarily for adolescents, but uh, you know another um, for older adults, um, things like Tai Chi yoga. Um, mindfulness even. So um, some of these uh, really, you know, lifestyle interventions uh, have been shown to be effective. Exercise is also a good one. Um, you know, just getting regular exercise uh, right. is also helpful for sleep. So, so some of these things sound really basic, but just doing them, you know, on a regular basis over time can really be helpful. Yes, can make a big difference um, for people we have been focusing on, on adolescence, um, but the um, brain continues to develop even in young adulthood. And I'm curious what the research shows about people in their early 20s and mm -hmm. these types of issues. Um, wh what do we know about that? Yeah, so, you know, the biggest, so for a lot of young people, there's a huge transition in young adulthood in terms of going off to college or, you know, living independently from one's parents. And so that is a huge shift. And so very often there is, um, you know, a major increase in things like stress and anxiety um, that young adults are dealing with just from, you know, the increased independence. And, you know, in some ways it's, it's a great thing, but in some ways, you know, it really presents a lot of challenges that, um, you may not be dealing with before, and also just there's no one structuring your time. And so, I mean, I think that those are things that a lot of um, young adults really struggle with um, if they haven't kind of set up those, you know, the, if they haven't sort of set up the self-regulation. Um, and so getting, you know, so for, for college students, Getting, you know, going to see your college, you know, your counselor, um, student psychological services on campus. I mean, I would really highly encourage that. Um, there are a lot of college campuses now that are um, implementing, including UCLA, um, implementing things like peer counseling and, uh, you know, really increasing mental health awareness um, to improve, you know, things like stress reduction because it's obviously, you know, you don't have to have a, you know, a mood disorder to really um, benefit from increased social support and uh, you know really strategies to help with resilience and so so I'm, I'm glad to see that a lot of college campuses are implementing these programs um, but it's it's definitely something to to recognize in oneself if you feel like you are getting um, increasingly stressed and anxious and and I think it's just you know it is there's some of that that's just normative because you know you're dealing with something you haven't dealt with before. And, you know, so getting getting help and talking to somebody um, before it sort of escalates is, is really important. Right. Getting help um, isn't in any way a sign of weakness. It really is a sign of strength. Um, and it's That's important exactly for people right. to emphasize that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Carrie, I, I want to thank you again um, for taking the time for this presentation, but more importantly, for the work that you've done um, to help improve our understanding and uh, I think ultimately have significant impact on treatment of these conditions. So thank you very, very much. It was my pleasure. Well, I really enjoyed um, talking to everyone. And uh, yeah, thanks for your questions. Good, good. Um, I also want to thank everybody in our audience for joining us. Uh, all of the research we fund is made possible through private donations. So if you'd like to make a gift, please visit our website, bbrfoundation.org, or call us at 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with a family member or a friend, please visit the webinar page on our website. And I hope you'll join us again next month when Dr. Carol Taminga, Foundation Scientific Council member and Chair of Psychiatry at the University of Texas South Southwestern Medical School will present a webinar about schizophrenia. This will take place on Wednesday, November 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. 
Once again, thank you and enjoy the rest of the day. Take care. Thanks.